Some stories have their own power, don't they? We'd rather believe the story than hear any evidence to the effect that the story is not true. So if somebody was described as a witch in the past, people got quite excited about that. And whatever evidence there was to the contrary was just swept aside. Because this is a good story, that, that woman living by herself who cures people must be a witch. I suppose the version we've got nowadays is people that might be regarded as paedophiles or something. They might not be a paedophile, but the idea that they might be is very, it's very strong, very persuasive. It's a good story. Let's run with it. So that's a rather unsavoury example. But stories have their own power. We like a good rumour. And let's not have it spoiled by fact, please. Stories of ghosts are like this, aren't they? We all enjoy a good ghost story. Just as much nowadays as our ancestors did. And our ancestors might not have had the benefit of pursuing a scientific inquiry. Many people in many cultures nowadays believe in ghosts. Maybe called different things. Perhaps in the Middle East, they believe in jinns or spirits. So these things engage the imagination. Stories of demonic possession are very much part of some people's lives and they shouldn't be dismissed. And yet at the same time, we don't need to buy in to their framework, their way of thinking, because these things can be like a virus Or perhaps what Richard Dawkins would call a meme. You get an idea in your head and it takes root. And you start to perceive reality in terms of that idea. So let's see what idea the yoga physicist has got about ghosts. But before I, I, I read this, I just want to mention something about the word which is used for ghost. It's pisacha. Just by, by pure coincidence, I came across this word elsewhere. I don't know if this is relevant, but it's such a coincidence I feel I should mention it. I came across this word in the Lankavatara Sutra. And the Buddha is talking about reality. And he says, The discriminating mind of the ignorant, which has been heated by false imaginations and speculations, is stirred into mirage-like waves by the winds of birth, growth and destruction. It is like the magician Pishacha, who by means of his spells makes a wooden image or a dead body throb with life, though it has no power of its own. So here Pishacha is the name of a magician who seems to be able to imbue inanimate objects with life. So that's one understanding. And perhaps because his name means ghost, this is what a ghost is supposed to do, isn't it? Imbue an inanimate object with life. So let's get a description of ghosts. Some ghosts have an ethereal body, though endowed with hands and feet, and they see people like you. Others have fearful shadowy forms. They overwhelm the bodies of human beings and influence their minds. Some of them kill or harm people. Some are like fog or mist, and others have dreamlike bodies. Some of them have bodies made of air alone. Some have bodies which are no more than the delusion of the perceiver. In other words, you see what you want to see. They cannot be grasped, nor can they grasp others. They experience heat and cold, pleasure and pain. But they cannot eat, drink or take anything. They have desire, hate, fear, anger, greed and delusion. They are charmed and brought under control by mantras, drugs, penance, charity, courage and righteousness. They are seen and also grasped if one rests on sattva. In other words, if you're pure hearted. Also, this can happen by the use of magical symbols, mandalas and formulas, mantras, and by worship performed by someone at some time and somewhere. I should point out that the realm of ghosts is one of the traditional realms in the Indian cosmology. 
there were six realms. The realm of the gods, the realm of the titans or the demons, the realms of the humans, as us, the realms of the animals, the hellish regions, and the realm of the ghosts. And the ghosts were often hungry. They had this hunger which could never be sated. So in a way these realms are what exist within us anyway. Some ghosts are of a divine nature and appear to be gods. Some are like humans and others like serpents. Some are like dogs and jackals and live in villages and forests or in blind wells, roadsides and other impure places. Some places have that atmosphere to them, don't they? As if there's something there, something beyond our senses. I shall now tell you about their origin. And now this belief in ghosts, this story about ghosts, will now take us back to consciousness. In the one infinite consciousness, there arises a notion which becomes the jiva, the individual. And then by becoming more and more dense, it becomes the ego sense or mind, which is later called Brahma, the creator. So that's an important point. Brahma, the creator, is the ego sense or the mind. All these and the whole world arise and exist in a notion. Hence they are unreal. It is experienced as real, just as one feels that one's notion is something real. In that sense, all these gods and other creatures are real. Because belief in the gods was and still is strong in India. That's the reality. In truth, however, there is neither a field here, nor a seed, nor a farmer, nor the tree known as creation of the world. However, in that notion of the field of creation, there exist all these beings. So, the field is creation, and the notions which arise in it are the seed, and the ego sense as the farmer. The resplendent ones among them are the gods, the half-baked ones are humans. They in whom there is a thick veil of impurity are the worms and such creatures. They who are devoid of any fruitfulness, who are empty and bodiless, asarira, are known as ghosts or pisachas. The differentiation is due not to the whim or fancy of the creator Brahma, but to their own choice. They become whatever they wish to become. However, in fact, they are all but consciousness appearing to be subtle bodies. Ativahika. It is on account of persistent self-deception that they seem to have physical or material forms. This could almost be a description of our subconscious, couldn't it? Of our basic drives. We have these drives to behave in certain ways, ways which we might not be happy about. It's almost as if somebody else is in the driving seat, isn't it? They're the ghosts in our machine, aren't they? So it's quite clear that ghosts can be regarded as something which is very much to do with something in us. The word drive is quite a nice neutral word. It takes all the drama out of it. The ghosts too exist in their own forms, doing what they have to do according to their own nature and experiencing various experiences. They see and communicate with one another as if in a dream. Some of them do not communicate, like the dream objects in a person's dream. Like the ghosts, there are also the goblins and disembodied beings. The ghosts create their own circle of darkness of ignorance, which even the sun's rays cannot penetrate. They thrive in the darkness of ignorance. The light of knowledge is their enemy. So there you go. They thrive in the darkness of ignorance. So really, we don't really want to have too much to do with thinking about ghosts. It's best, if possible, to bring it into a psychological way of thinking and to look at the basic emotions which are underpinning any relationship with ghosts.